What's up, everybody? I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports. Welcome to another episode of the My Other Passion Podcast. Today, we have two awesome guests who have a lot to say. One is Jake Paul, the boxer, YouTuber, TikToker, slash everything else on the internet, and his business partner, Joey Levy. These two just started a micro-betting, sports betting company called Better. We talked to them about the company. We talked to them about their business strategy, their overall mission. And of course, having Jake on, we have to talk about his beefs, the people that he's boxing against, the fight that he just announced that's upcoming in October. It's a great conversation. I'm not going to keep us waiting any longer. Let's go ahead and hear from our partners over at NetSuite, and we will be right back. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. That's true when your business is growing fast, but that's even more true when there's a lot of uncertainty. Inflation is running rampant. Supply chains are clogged. The labor market is tight. What does that mean for your margins? Well, not every business is in the dark. Over 31,000 businesses know everything about their numbers because they use NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite is going to give you visibility and control of your financials, your planning, budgeting, of course, inventory. It's going to let you manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve those margins. NetSuite will also help you identify rising costs, automate your manual business processes, and ultimately see where to save money. Know your numbers, know your business, and get to know how NetSuite can be the source of truth for your entire company. Right now, you're in luck because NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. One more time, netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. Everything from there should be easy, and your business is going to benefit from it. And now back to our conversation with Jake Paul and Joey Levy. All right, Jake Paul, Joey Levy. Welcome to the My Other Passion podcast. Appreciate you all jumping on. Uh, a lot of big news with you all recently, so I'm excited to talk about it. How's everyone doing? Good, man. Good uh, Good being on. Yeah, busy, busy. Yeah, you know, the, the race starts now, um, and it's just excited to be launched and have a lot of work in front of us. Yeah, better. The new company. Um you guys are placing a lot on that. How did you pull down this fifty million dollar Series A round? Um, yeah, I mean, took some time to you know raise the capital, but um, I think the investors that we we ultimately raised money from were just really enthusiastic about the the product vision and the distribution vision, right? So, from a product standpoint, we're and really like in this industry in general, you have like 55 direct to consumer sports betting brands that have all offer, been offering like the same exact product, right? Like money lines, point spreads, over unders and the same type spreadsheet like UI that really isn't entertaining or engaging. And I think investors really resonated with the vision of just launching something new, different, interesting, and, and really something built for the next generation of sports fans focused on instant gratification. So a really differentiated product vision combined with a really differentiated distribution vision of, of really disrupting what, what is a pretty stale sports media landscape right now um, with, with original content and, and Jake really leading the charge there. And I think that combined with just having built successful businesses before and, and having a, a large network of investors who've had success with us um, gave, gave us a head start on, on the capital raising as well. Yeah, Jake, you say you turned down 40 mil in endorsements to go forth with better, right? Yeah, 100%. There was, you know, tons of offers uh, to me from these like crypto online casinos, like offshore books that are illegal um, and that people are using VPNs to bet with. Um, and yeah, they they were offering me money, a lot of money. But um, you know, it's I'm a firm believer in what we have going on in the team here and the product differentiation. Um, you know, I didn't like sports betting until I started micro betting and playing the demo that Joey uh, let me use. It was so much more fun. Um, and so I knew that this product could be huge. And then, you know, you add me into the equation and bring in the marketing and the creative and the media side of things. And then we have a, a killer team set up. Well, the one thing is that this space is so, so crowded, right? You have a ton of huge players already and they are spending so much money. They're spending like all their money, billions of dollars on customer acquisition. 
So when customers are already entrenched and they have their favorites, they know they go to FanDuel, they know they go to DraftKings, they know that they do traditional betting, they like their money lines. Like, how do you convince someone to do what better is trying to make happen? Because I feel like for all the potential of micro betting, it's also kind of looked at as like a novelty. It's looked at as like not real betting or, you know, it's more of just like, gimmicky pot potentially right i'm trying to have a little devil's advocate looking at what you guys are up against uh so so how do you do that and and ultimately try to have some success in this market that's just super crowded already yeah so i'd say a couple things to that um one is with respect to to, to micro betting and, and why we were so bullish on this form of betting is, is ultimately what, what we believe could be the predominant way people bet on sports in this country. It really comes down to there's two key factors here. So unlike the global regulated sports betting market before the U.S., like if you think of like, like, like the U.S. is a very nascent market, right? Like you alluded to it being incredibly crowded. There's all these customers, there, there's all these operators spending billions of dollars on customer acquisition, but this industry in the U.S. has only been around for about four years, right? So the glo so all of product and technology pretty much has been built for a global audience, and it's kind of been modified a little bit for U.S. audience. But um, the global market has has historically been driven by soccer, and soccer is a is a match outcome based betting sport, right? Because if you think of how a soccer match works, it's a very fluid game. There's not a lot of scoring. There's not really any discrete occurrences to bet on. But if you think of the cadence of U.S. sports, it's it's pretty much the exact opposite, right? Like baseball is driven by pitches and at-bats. Football is driven by plays and drives. Even basketball, which is a more fluid game, is driven by dozens of possessions and a lot of scoring and speculation over superstar players and what they'll do next. So, U.S. sports are built for moment-to-moment -moment betting and just generally feature a very different cadence than what has driven the global regula regulated market to date. But because there was such a gold rush right after PASPA was repealed in, in May of 2018, nobody had really like had the time or focus to like fundamentally reimagine like what the U.S. sports gaming consumer experience should look and feel like. So the the composition of U.S. sports combined with um, and Jake knows this better than anybody, like this next generation of consumer feeling like like the tighter the feedback loop, like the like like all consumers of all demographics, but particularly the 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 next generation wanting like like exhibiting the like lower attention spans, right? Like there's a reason why TikTok is is has become the fastest, most successful consumer app of all time, right? They you know, like a 20 minute YouTube video is is, is almost too long nowadays. So you need kind of like a 30 to, to 60 second TikTok. Um so, so you think basically combined. that's gonna go to betting. Like you you feel like that same mindset is gonna shift to betting, even though it might be a certain way now. What do you guys give it? it it's before, it's also before that's... just one point I want to make quickly on this. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. Is that like this has already happened in the gambling market? So if you look at what drives most of the gambling revenue historically, by far, it's not blackjack, it's not roulette, it's not poker, it's not sports betting, it's slots. And what's the appeal of slots? It's the it's the tight feedback loop. It's the idea of you push a button, you make a you make a prediction, and right away you know whether or not you won or lost. And yeah, I just think like understanding culture and where everything is moving, the attention spans are going down. And like I said, when I played the app, I was only betting like 10, 15, $20. So it wasn't like I needed to bet a ton of money to have fun. It was just so cool to see whether or not I got the pick right uh, in, in real time versus like waiting for the whole entire game to be over. And everything in our generation is moving to quicker faster um and just just like TikTok is proving that's how humans are consuming and i think micro betting will give people a outlet to have more fun uh, and to make more sports more engaging you're such a renegade too like we spoke earlier this year we know that's your brand you're very cognizant of that how do you bring that into the marketing and and ultimately come in and disrupt the way that you did in boxing or on youtube or what have you like cool we get the concept but you still have to sell it to people so i know a big part of that is where you come in jake what's like the vision 
what's the vision to make that happen? Yeah. So like you said earlier, these companies are spending billions of dollars on marketing and that's not the way to properly acquire an audience or to build a brand. You have to really put tons of effort into your media strategy, into your content, content and to grow an audience that actually cares about what you're doing and, and the people around you. And just like in boxing, I see a market that's old, outdated and archaic, even though it's already just been around for a couple of years. Um, it's the same commercials. It, it's the same offerings. And after, you know, I think 48 hours, we passed a lot of these billion dollar companies on Instagram uh, with, with our following after 48 hours. I saw that. Zero, with zero dollars spent. Um, and so that alone should just prove to people like there's a new sheriff in town and like we have our finger on the pulse of this generation and the next generation of sports fans and betting wasn't cool and isn't cool to people who are like 21 to 30 years old. It's not really talked about. There's no community around it. There's no social element to it really. Um, and we're looking to change all of that. And we know how to change all of that. I've, you know, been doing media and content my whole entire life. And that's like my, my bread and butter. Well, part of your brand is like, like you're not, you won't hesitate to call somebody out. I mean, just looking at your Twitter past couple of days and, and really the past few years, like you're coming for people's necks. Is that part of the strategy? Are you going to call out the competitors and FanDuel, DraftKings, like here's where I, why I think you suck and here's where I'm coming for you? Just because like that's your style in so many other realms. So how are you going to approach it now? You got this big sports betting business. Yeah, no, look, I mean, that that's not our main strategy or goal here. I, I think you'll see a less brash version of myself, um, but definitely we feel passionate that we are better than them. Hence the word better, hence the, the branding, <laughs> like it all ties together. And so we feel like we're better. And if that passion seeks through, seeps through and like people, you know, want to get into some beefs or whatever, like, then so be it, we're, we're down. Uh, but obviously that's, that, that won't be our main strategy here, like, which is opposite of my fight world and strategy. We're, we're very familiar. <laughs> yeah, What's... we want, we, we think our, we think our superior product and media distribution strategy will speak for itself on, on this front. So, so what are you guys relationship? Like, you know, I know, um, Jake, the anti fun invested in simple bet. And then Joey, you wind up leaving simple bet to start this company with Jake. Um, so it's a little bit of the business background, but like, who are you guys? Like, do you, you know, are you just kind of like, yo, get on zoom, do some emails, make some meetings. Are you kicking it? You know, on some real life we're buddy stuff. Just what, what's the rapport between you two? I think it's, I think it's all of the above. Um, you know, it's, it's business, it's zooms, it's in-person meetings. We've had two, two giant board meetings already. Um, a lot of dinner meetings. And then we just recently were in Miami. We got a content house for like 10 days and the whole entire team was there. Um, and the whole entire team is, is awesome. And I think we've all grown to, to become close friends uh, very early on in this, in this company. So it's really cool. I think the culture that we're building, and I think that's going to come across to the rest of the world. Nice. Uh, Joey, what do you have to say about that? Like, what, how do you build a relationship with Jake? I mean, you know, it's kind of this yin and gang. He's the famous loud guy. You are, you know, executive and have kind of been in the business realm for a long time in a more traditional sense. Um, so, so what's it like working with, with Jake? Yeah. I mean, in I a think different capacity than like how a lot of people view him publicly. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, yeah, everything Jake just said is, is totally right. And I think this content house we just did in Miami was, was great because it was like, for me, I like actually stayed in the house and I thought it was like, 
going to like for like I'm a non media exec too. Right. So like, aside from being like a traditional sort of like startup sports betting person, like I've been down to sports betting, daily fantasy sports, micro betting, like rabbit hole for the last decade or so. Um, but being around, like just seeing the content creation and everything that goes into that was like really beneficial to me, but then also like spending a ton of time with Jake and the rest of the team, like getting to know everybody I, I thought was really awesome. And, and one other thing to point out is like, we live in this post COVID world where like people are doing zoom meetings and working on Slack, but like we're, we're building this thing together in Miami and Puerto Rico. So like we do have that sort of leg up from like a culture standpoint where like what we do is predominantly in person and, and it, it, it enables like relationships to, to further develop as a result of that. Um, but also like the, the other thing too, like I, I think one of the advantages perhaps like that we both have as executives of this business is like Jake's 25, I'm 27, right? So like, even though like I've been in the industry for about a decade or so, that's a product of me dropping out of college and, and doing this full time, but we're, we're like similar age and in touch with consumers um, in this industry, which I, I don't think other execs in the space, it's, it's hard to build product for people in their twenties and thirties, if you're not sort of, um, part of that demographic. How does being a boxer like mesh with this? Right. I think there's probably, I see there's so many people have endorsements now with the sports books and all that stuff. And it's like, how are athletes being so involved in betting for one? Like, I think there's like a, a sense of concern there. Right. But also on a positive note, like, how are you going to leverage all this power and fame that you've gained in boxing to to make better, you know, a success? Yeah, no. So a big part of this idea uh, of me wanting to partner with someone like Joey was because I saw how much money these other sports books were paying me for my fights for like two hours worth of uh, sponsorship. And I was just like, wow, that's, that's insane. <laughs> and there's so much money, obviously, in this industry, and I don't think they're spending it right. Um, and so for me, you know, as an athlete, everyone wants to bet on my fights. And I have that audience, I think that's some of people's favorite things to bet on is fights. Um, and so it just ties perfectly in, you know, I'm pushing Joey, uh, to, to get the product to be able to work with fighting because uh, there's no such thing as micro betting in fighting yet. But that to me is just going to be game changer. Like if you think about who will land the first punch in the next round, you know, like all, all of these things, um, all these different moments within fighting that, that you could bet on, like who – who will get cut next or like, I, I don't know. We haven't thought of or brainstormed the ideas, but there's going to be so many that, that come up and I'm, I'm pushing Joey. Uh, it's going to take some time for us to get that product, but um, that's, that's how it'll all tie together. You're talking about, well, at least who's going to land the first punch, which makes me think about what you just announced a few hours ago. You got the contract signed. You said October is yours. Can you just tell us like who you're fighting? <laughs> I can't yet. I can't yet. I got to save that announcement. Uh, for, I think it'll be coming out here in the next couple of days, but it's a big name, biggest opponent yet, hardest fight yet. Um, and I think people are going to be shocked with this announcement. And I'm excited because I know it's someone who will actually get in the ring with me. Um, all the other opponents have backed out. So it feels good to know that I'm actually going to have a fight. The past two training camps, I've just been training like with this thought in the back of my mind that th these opponents are going to pull out. But this one, I know we'll get into the ring. Yeah, the the starts and stops with all the fights. Like, are you disappointed or, you know, you've talked your stuff, but how also like, Ultimately, how did that feel? Were you hyped up and then like you were like hurt or disappointed or or were you like, no, nah, I knew this dude was going to 
do this anyway? Like, how are you taking that outside of Twitter in your real life personally? Yeah, no, you know, I always had this gut feeling that the last fight wasn't going to happen. But at the end of the day, I'm still showing up at practice, giving it my all, dedicating everything for months at a time. And so when it doesn't happen a week before the fight, it's really, really disappointing in it. It sucks, man. It it actually affected me. Like I was like for a week straight, just like sort of just depressed. Um, And I just love to fight. It's a part of who I am. And so um, and and then we also had to change everything around with with the better launch. And so it like the butterfly effect of everything um, created a lot more work for everyone. But it is what it is. And um i just try to focus on the positive which is i got four or five extra months of day in and day out training um at a super high level so now that's going to show in my next fight what do you do when you're you know quote to quote you depressed because i think people kind of struggle with the concept of successful or you know, rich people being depressed. Like if you go and tweet right now, I'm depressed. Everyone's going to be like, you have money, go drive your car. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So like, what, what, what is that like? Like, do you just sit in your crib or do you go on a yacht to try to make yourself feel better? Like, what did you do? Nah, for me, it's like a lot of internal thinking and I I try not to let it like plague me for an extended period of time. But it's like meditation. Um, And what people don't understand is like cars and money. Those things don't make you happy. What makes me happy is, you know, going into the ring and knocking someone out (laughs) and um, completing a challenge. I'm very like task oriented. And so I love to like complete a task and to complete a challenge and, um, yeah, and, and, and it's, it sucks, man. I have a team of like 20 people working towards the same goal as well. And so everyone's sad. It's like a group collective energy. Like we, I, it's not, I'm not just here by myself punching a bag in Puerto Rico. It's like there's a lot of people here. And so the whole team is like, damn, we've been working nonstop and putting our all into this. Um, so, yeah, it sucks. And, and trust me. I've seen people who you wouldn't believe be the saddest people in the world. I've I've seen people with hundreds of millions of dollars and billions of dollars be the most miserable people. So, uh, well, you got the next won't. fight locked in. So you got you know the sad boy era can can come to an end yeah. for now. But like, how do you balance the training and the boxing with trying to get you know this this business really up and running with Joey and Joey like? What do you run into trying to run a business when you have someone as like busy and in demand as, as Jake as your partner? I think I think what it comes down to is the team we've built around us that enables me to do what I'm best at um, and to show up in certain moments and to, to give feedback. But man, like, you know, you can't box the whole entire day. So you'll literally burn out. So, you know, even if I'm training for like four hours, five hours a day, sleeping for like eight to 10, depending on the recovery, it's like I have the rest of the time to to work on uh, better and my show BS with Jake Paul and um, all of those things. Joey, do you get um, times where the, where you know, is, is Jake like super responsive on email? People always say, like for instance sometimes you can't get a hold of someone or i don't want to like i don't really believe in like hierarchies of humans but i will say sometimes it's like someone who has an entry level position and you can't get a hold of them but yet the billionaire is responding to emails in 2 seconds and you're like how does this work how is jake is he super responsive or is he hard to get a hold of like yeah there you- there haven't been any there haven't been any responding issues i i, I think um we're 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 all really into this and and as jake pointed out like and one of the things for for both of us when we were setting this thing up is like we know where we should be channeling our time and energy and we were really deliberate and methodical with respect to like 
what executive team do we put in here to create the infrastructure internally to ensure that, you know, I show up and I get to do what I do best and Jake shows up and he gets to do what he does best. And, um, and, and, you know, just being the leaders of, of the organization and, um, and the team has really stepped up and done an incredible job um, for, for really what's, what's been, you know, we, we started really putting this thing together about a year or so, probably a little bit less than that. And um, just really proud of the team that we're building and we're expanding the team and, and we're only going to grow stronger as we do that. But, um, but, um, but no, it's been, it's been working so far and, and I think we're only going to get better over time. What percentage of your time, Jake, outside of the ring is going to better? Because, like, you have a fund, you have all these businesses, but this is the new one with all the momentum. Is, like, this the one that your heart is in the most and, and the one you're thinking about the most? Yeah, I think about it all the time. Um, outside of the ring, it's, you know, it's one of my main priorities. You know, my, my girlfriend even gets mad at me sometimes <laughs> um, for – how much effort I'm, I'm putting in, but that, that's what it takes um, to build a, a business like this. Um, and all, everyone shares that same passion. Um, and the fund is a large investor into this business. Um, so, you know, it's, it's in the fund's interest as well to, for, for this to succeed. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm heads down. It's, it's boxing, better family and sleep <laughs> are you are you starting a family soon i know you said you want to when are when are you popping up with the baby pictures yeah i, I don't know i don't know me, me and julia are talking about it um so we'll, we'll see what ends up happening we just got a little puppy and i think it made both julia and i like want a kid even more um so we'll see i think it'd be cool to to be a super young father. Yeah, I got two. I had my first at 27. So like you're knocking on that door. It's, it's been cool. I like, I like thinking about how I'll be in like my mid forties once they're going to college and stuff. Whereas I think all my friends are going to have like toddlers when they're in their mid forties. No, um, exactly. I, I want to be a, I want to be a young dad and I, I want to, hopefully my kid, um, but becomes a, a boxer. I want to be their boxing coach. Yeah, definitely. I'm like, I take my son out and my daughter. In fact, soccer starts for them in like two weeks. It's a beautiful thing building that up. And also I understand why my dad was the way he was with me with basketball. Now, you know, you, you get it. You're like, you have an opportunity. Like you truly sports is one thing. I mean, I think in general, you know what it's like to be an entertainer and you can make music, you can be an actor, whatever, but also sports. One thing about sports that I love, it's not perfect, but it's like the hardest workers are going to make it, which I don't think is always the case with music, music, you know, maybe sports has a little bit of like a lucky break, but it's very, it's a little more like egalitarian. I feel like where it's like the best basketball players make it to the NBA, like pretty much right. The best boxers, are successful boxers and there's a lot of people who make good music who just they didn't catch a break you know it's so true man that there's incredible artists out there who just aren't breaking through so i i know exactly what you mean and that's part of the reason i love boxing is just if you work hard you're gonna get the results yeah speaking of music like i know you have made music but who, who are you listening to just on some I know we're here we're talking about better and everything, but also like part of the theme of this podcast is finding out more about who people are. Like I actually saw an interview that you had, Jake, and you kind of were like, had some tension with this person because they were asking certain stuff that you were like, well, damn, like, can you ask about who I am as a person? Like what my hobbies are, stuff like that. And that really resonated with me because I just think that ties into what you care about with business that ties into with your work ethic with sports. And, and I think it's really interesting and important. Um, but yeah, we had like Kendrick drop this year. We have Drake drop this year, but even beyond the superstars, just like what has caught your ear recently? Um, Central C from the UK. He's fire. Um, so I've been listening to a lot of his stuff and he, he's sort of, I'm um, starting to get popular in America, uh, but 
he's he's really good. I've been listening to a lot of his stuff. Joey, are you a music guy? Kind of, yeah. I grew up in uh, grew up in South Florida, so kind of like was raised on like Rick Ross and all that. So it was super cool to see um, he, he's coming on the show, um, or he came on the show. We're going to put out that episode soon. Um, but uh, yeah, not like a huge like I'm. I have a pretty eclectic taste. I kind of just uh, like like a little bit of everything. No, I feel you. I'm the same way. Speaking of Rose, the boss, you and him. I know you know I'm going to ask about the the ten million dollars. Is the guy in October getting ten million from Rick Ross to fight you? Nah. So he he signed uh, the contract, or or he's about to. I think later today they verbally agreed, and like it's about to be signed. So, um, so he he, he didn't need that extra <laughs> money to get. Into well, the what game. is that about? What is you and Rick Ross's relationship, and why is he out here offering people ten million dollars to fight you? And just like, what do you and Ross do when you hang out? Yeah. So um, sometimes we'll go to dinner. Um, we're, we're usually just getting up and just bullshitting about life, honestly, but, uh, he's a really cool guy, man. And I've just been like sort of venting to him about how a lot of these people have pulled out of the fights and have been scared to fight me. And he was like, I'll put up $10 million for your next opponent to get into the ring. Um, so he, he just wants to see me succeed and he's, kind of been like a mentor to me in, in a in a cool way like just giving me a lot of like og advice and um he's just a really good high, good guy with a big heart well i was about to say because because ross i think his stature comes with i can give you advice i can teach you how to live your life the right way and that's the type of things he's always posting on instagram right he's telling people how to get their money right, how to approach business. If you're not waking up by this time in the morning, how do you expect to accomplish anything, et cetera? What type of game has Rick Ross given you that's really stuck with you? And you think about it, you know, it could come up when you're training. It could come up when you just wake up in the morning. I think the 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 big thing was um, him t talking about, like, fans to me and, um, like, dealing – with people like constantly being in your life and like not getting any private time um, and just reinforcing to me that like to take a picture and to sign the autograph of like every single person that you possibly can. Um, because I, I was like, man, like it, it gets so tiring sometimes. And he's like, no, bro, like, <laughs> You, you're changing that person's life for, for the rest of their life. And the, they may never meet another famous person. Um, so he, he really just like reinforced that to me because I've been dealing with it since I was like 16 years old. And so it's been like nine years. I don't, I don't really even remember what it was like to have a normal life and, and to not I, like I, to not be able to like go in public and shit like that. Um, so he just like gave me a, a ton of, you know, advice on, on that and dealing with that. While we're, I want to talk more about um, better because I have some more thoughts there that I would love insight on. But while we're talking about rapper advice, I know Drake DM'd you after one of your knockouts, right? Um, and I know you all have a bit of a relationship. Are you, are you all still in contact? And perhaps what is the, biggest rapper in the world drake uh said to you that stuck with you yeah man um we definitely are, are still in contact uh like here and there we're, we're both busy i talked to a lot of people on his team actually i've been friends with uh the people on his team longer than i've known drake um a lot of the ovo guys and man he uh just continued to give me motivation uh, by basically saying that like what I'm doing is unprecedented in, in the sport of boxing. Um, and he like compared me to this movie, 14 Peaks, and he compared me to this guy, Nims. And he was like, you need to watch this movie. And I, I see you one day will have a movie and a documentary like this guy. Um, and so 
I hadn't seen it. And then I went and watched it and I was like, wow, like to think that like Drake thinks of me, like this guy is pretty, pretty cool and it's motivating. And it just like continues to make me want to work even harder um, because I know what I'm doing. I know, I know that it's special. I know why I'm doing it. Um, but sometimes, you know, when you get into the routine of something and it's monotonous and you're in the gym and it's, you know, just you in there every single day working nonstop. Um, it's cool to get some motivation like that sometimes. Definitely. So we're talking and I appreciate it because, um, like I said, I think it's really the multifaceted nature of, of all people is, is what fascinates me. And so with that in mind, we're talking about movies, we're talking about music. Is that something that you're looking to incorporate into better? Just because like every time, I don't know, every Super Bowl, not only are there sports bets, there's, is the artist going to bring this person out? What song are they going to perform first? And that seems like a perfect fit for micro betting. But in all honesty, I don't really know legally how that works or if it's something that, you know, it's just like the flip of a switch, but uh, it seems like that's a rising component of the betting space. And so like you all are all about TikTokification, social media, like how do you expand beyond sports? Yeah, eventually we want to enable consumers to simply be able to bet on anything, right? I think as you correctly pointed out, there's some sort of regulatory and, and legal implications to that, like specifically with respect to like integrity, right? Like, the, like whoever's controlling that IP could presumably, you know, alter what the line would be in or, it, you know, it kind of goes without saying that that needs to be closely monitored, but eventually that's where we see this going. But the Super Bowl is a good example of like, like one way I like to describe our business and micro betting in general is like, imagine all those Super Bowl props that you could take before the Super Bowl. It's typically around like the first play or the first drive or the first catch or whatever, and enable that for every moment of the game and enable that for any game, both preseason, regular season, as significant as the Super Bowl or as minor as like a two and 14 team playing in week 17. Like that's, that's kind of what this business is built to enable. You want to see... Uh, some some micro betting across other mediums, Jake. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and I think um, creating like a more social aspect uh, to, to the whole betting experience. So we we have some ideas, um, but yeah, it'll it'll just make everything more fun. So that you know, that's one of our slogans. I think is like sports just got better, and I think that's because with micro betting, you know, you're so intrigued with the game and each play. Yeah, I could see myself. I'm not a betting man, but I could see myself popping in for something like this because like I can't with the spreads and the money lines. And I just, I, I'm not that guy, but I can definitely say, Hey, this person's going to score next. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think no, that's exactly. what you all are betting on. No. And that's what we wanted to do is to simplify the betting experience and, that's the reason why the younger and the next generation doesn't isn't really super involved. It's because like the parlays and the minus three thousand odds, like no one knows what that means. Um, and so the barrier to entry is very high. Um, and so we almost the analogy is like e trade and like buying stocks on e trade versus when Robinhood came out, it just made it so much easier for everyone. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is all like, we don't even view this totally as like a gambling business. This is like an entertainment company because ultimately what sports betting does is enhances the consumption of sport, right? And the existing products today, they feel like you're interacting with like a financial spreadsheet UI layer with, with just unintuitive lingo that's sort of driving the product experience. So um, just making everything simpler, more intuitive and more entertaining is, is really the core of everything we're trying to do here. Definitely. I feel like um, this will probably come up being that you all are going to have this visibility across sports. Um, like, I don't know how much you all personally follow and what your fandom is, but I assume better is going to have you a lot more like plugged in with what's happening 
every other night between, you know, all the different leagues. But what do you think about, like, just as a businessman and seeing these crazy eight, nine figure numbers tossed around, what do you think of the whole live golf PGA tour situation, Jake? I think it's crazy and awesome. And um, it's, you know, futuristic. And I think we actually like want to be in golf because golf is a, a perfect sport. I um, a perfect cadence to have micro betting to be a part of. Um, so yeah, there could be some awesome opportunities there and yeah, it's, it's just awesome to see those business and entrepreneurs like create something new like that. That's gaining already a ton of traction. Right. I mean, you're out. I say this a bunch, but like we said it when we spoke, you know, earlier this year like disrupting is what you're all about live has certainly come in and disrupted are you on the side of live or do you feel like yo go change up this format like i'm all for breaking down traditional systems um you know are you are you feeling what they're doing yeah for sure i I love innovators Uh, i love disruptors and i resonate a ton with them because that's what I am. And uh, that's what I've built my whole entire career off of. So I respect people who have big ambitions and want to be the best in a market that has sort of been the same for a really long time. So that makes me think, in fact, I just saw Rory McIlroy and Tiger like launch their own little micro league thing today. Um, You've said so much about fighter pay. It seems like you, you know, when we spoke earlier this year, it was like, it was like you were really going hard at UFC, at at fighter pay, at all of this. Um, Where do you stand on all of that now? Like, did it become a bit of like a moot point to try to keep on like poking at Dana? And also, um, people are starting all these leagues. Like, do you think that's something you could do is just say, yo, I'm going to build my own thing. I'm going to build a competitor to UFC. Yeah, there's, there's definitely conversations happening around that, um, that point specifically. But as far as fighter pay, man, I'm, you know, I'm still doing as much that I can to help. Um, And, you know, even my last fight that got canceled, um, I still paid the fighters on the undercard 50% of their purse just because I know what it's like for these fighters to be in a training camp and to have all of these expenses. Um, and so when Hasim pulled out, they were left with no paycheck that was going to come. Um, and so I paid them 50% of what they were going to get paid uh, just to help out. And it's setting examples like that moving forward in the sport of boxing where like things need to change. Um, but I'm, I'm still pushing on all fronts. Uh, but you know, I'm 25 years old and I, I sort of feel like I've taken it on my back. And a lot of the UFC fighters have gone quiet. You know, we saw Luke Rockhold speak up, um, which was amazing. And there just needs to be more people like Luke, out there who have the courage to speak up um, uh, against fighter pay. Cool. Good to know where you stand. Um, You've been very vocal all year. Where do you all stand on uh, sports media? I just saw this headline about was like Jake Paul is trying to change sports media. I think of sports media as a lot bigger than betting. You know, I think about ourselves at FOS. I think about, Disney owning ESPN, like, you know, better is like a part of a larger ecosystem. Uh, It seems like you all came in strategically minded about the role that media plays in, in advancing the conversation of sports betting, because like the podcast is a huge part of what you all are doing at better. Um, Can you tell us more about like, how you want to kind of come in and change things when it comes to media like broad media with your podcast with um you know you 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 had that in that same article you're kind of like taking shots at Stephen A. Smith which you know neither here nor there I know people who love him and are super entertained by him I know people who are like 
I'm tired of this. And how do you get those people's attention and, and bring them over to like your vision of how sports media should be? Yeah, look, I mean, um, I think there's just a ton of people who are running sports media that are just old and it's like outdated. Um, and the newer generation doesn't latch on to that type of stuff. Um, and so really what we're doing at better is just taking it day by day with like, what can we change today? Right. We're, we're a startup. Um, there's, you know, maybe 10, 10 of us, um, as of now. Um, and so we need a lot of support and a lot of infrastructure and that will come with time, but slowly we're going to start to chip away just like I, I did in boxing at first, no one really cared about me boxing or what I had to say about the sport to boom three years later, it's like top five paid boxer. And I think people really have, you know, care about what I've done for the sport and people like Amanda Serrano and, they care about what I have to say. Um, so we're slowly just going to chip away at it and just bring a different approach. You know, this is why athletes have coaches is because they can see from the outside what the athlete is doing wrong. These sports media people have been doing the same thing for 20, 30 years, and they haven't really taken a bird's eye view or started from scratch um, as to what they could create. So that's really our advantage is coming in with a fresh, clean slate. But what is that fresh, clean slate? Like, okay, you have a podcast and the other people are old, but what do you ultimately do? For instance, I, micro betting is the thing that changes sports betting. How do you change me? Or what are you actually going to say or do that changes how this whole thing runs? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think, First and foremost, it's like, like even like undermining that in and of itself is is crazy. It's like a sport, a new sports show with like a young guest um, and a young host and and younger guests that you know haven't done sports shows before. That in and of itself is is changing the world. You know, content is everything. So someone like Tyler Hero coming on to my show who typically has never done interviews and never really opened up. You never really got to see his personality before. Um, you know, who, who knows the ripple effect that that has. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's our starting point it is, is this show and building out a talent network um, and, and delivering content. You know, we have ideas for all of these different sports leagues and, influencers going head to head um, and really like creating original content within the space um, and being ground floor at these stadiums, at these sporting events. Um, yeah. So, I mean, and, and again, this is after, this is like three, four months worth of work and, um, and, and we have a long, long way to go. By no means is this what better is. Like, you know, this is... You're not taking down ESPN just yet. No, I, I don't... We'll, we'll never take down ESPN. That's not our goal. That's not our goal is not to take down ESPN. The goal is to capture the eye of the next generation of sports fans and to deliver them what it would be like if ESPN launched today. Uh, and that's, that's really the differentiation. What about you, Joey? What do you uh, wake up or go into these meetings thinking about where you all want to take it in sports media? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, as you know, there's like this increasing and uh, rapidly increasing convergence of sports betting and sports media, right? Because like, again, like not viewing sports betting as like a gambling vertical, it's an, it's, it's a form of entertainment, right? It's like a way of enhancing the consumption of sports. So I think we're perhaps the first company that from the ground floor, from scratch, seeking to disrupt legacy sports book and legacy sports media at the same time, 
but I think it makes a lot of sense to do them both at the same time so that what we do from a media standpoint can contribute to what we're doing from, from a betting product standpoint and vice versa. Right. So I think, and, and I, I view both independently as multi-billion dollar opportunities with respect to the, the independent asset values of, of each of these two arms. So, um, we're embarking upon something very difficult that nobody's done before. Um, and, and in terms of the focus, I mean, I think it all comes down to like, again, on the product side, like the consumer experience, like anybody should be able to pick up better and just intuitively use it and feel joy from using it, right? Like be entertained by the product. And then from a media standpoint, just like authentically be engaged with the content and, and, and really viewing the media platform as like, not just a brand awareness vehicle, right? Like Jake has a large audience. Like I think a lot of people familiar with sports and media have already been introduced to better, but really creating brand affinity, right? Like I don't think anybody in this industry, in the sports betting industry has really created a brand that has true affinity except for barstool sports, right? Like nobody's walking down the street wearing like a FanDuel or DraftKings hoodie, right? But like you know, Barstool has done that. I think from a product standpoint, there, there, there's a lack of differentiation there that I think focusing on micro betting and the simple user experience will enable us to solve for that. But um, I think our approach with respect to both verticals are, are very complementary and, um, and, and independently something that needs to be done across both verticals. That Barstool deal is crazy. You guys saw last week, they got a, I mean, Penn National had invested in them, but now they're acquiring all of them. So they're going to cash out pretty nicely. Is that is that a goal for you all, getting acquired? Like, you know, transparently, I know you're trying to build this business, but do you just want, like, some conglomerate to come in and buy it and you all can, like, you know, cash out no, crazy? No, no. The goal here is to build the category-defining consumer business across both gambling and media, which we view as a, as a, as an opportunity worth tens of billions of dollars. That's All right. the goal. Cool. I got a couple more things. And I appreciate the time we can get out of here. Um, Jake, you talking about Tyler hero made me think about like, what athletes are you friendly with? Um, I loved hearing about the advice and the conversations with Rick Ross and Drake and so much of your, relationships that are public with other athletes are about tension are about, you know, drama. Um, is there anyone or a few guys or women who, you know, you really rock with and you build and you just like get good advice from them? If I don't know if you want to name drop, but if there's anyone who's like a Rick Ross or a Drake that you're like, yo, this person really put me on to something. Yeah, I think, um, my relationship with Mike Tyson has been awesome. Um, and he's given me a ton of great advice and wisdom. Um, again, like dealing with people and, uh, my team and all sorts of things and, you know, how to get your mind right for fights. Um, and so he just has so much advice and so much wisdom. He's like an encyclopedia. Um, and so, He's a really great guy and sort of embraced me in the world of boxing and was one of the first people to embrace me in the world of boxing. So I remember uh, when I saw Mike say, you got to respect Logan and Jake, I was like, all right, like you, Mike Tyson said this. So, <laughs> so we really have to like, take, take some word here. Like one does, is he able to give you advice on business? Um, you know, He's done a lot of stuff, right, over the past 30 plus years. Um, and it's business advice and then like fighting advice. Does Mike come to you and say, like, yo, you need to look, you need to throw your jab this way, you need to look at defense that way? Like, what does he say about business and what does he say about in the ring? On the business side of things, the biggest thing he was talking about was like surrounding myself with amazing people and to save my money. He said, don't spend any money. <laughs> don't spend any money. Um, and then, yeah, on the fighting stuff, it's more mindset focused and like how he thinks going into the ring. Um, because he said, it's all, he's like, it's all mental. It's all mental. Like physically, all humans are basically going to be the same. The, the fight is won mentally with game plan, preparation, studying, knowing what you're going to do. 
Um, and so he was really a big advocate on that. What do you study though? Like what's, what is the mental difference? I think we all know, Hey, get your mind right before you go in. But what is exactly a thing or two that like you really have to be aware of if you're going to win the mental game? Um, I think it's confidence and truly deep, deep, deep down believing that you're going to win and meditation, visualization, manifesting it, seeing the fight play over and over again every single day leading up to the fight so that when you're in the ring, you've already made those connections in your brain and you've already been there. You've already lived this moment. Um, and just dispelling as much fear as possible. Um, because when you get into the ring, you know, you can get hit with a good punch and then all of a sudden you're like, well, damn, I don't know if I want to make myself vulnerable again and like open up and throw another crazy combination because what if they hit me again with that big punch? But no, the, the scared fighter never wins. You have to be the hammer and not the nail. Um, and so it's just that like relentless fighter spirit inside of the ring. Is there any room for that fear to creep in? Like you're, you're so confident. You're like, yo, I've never seen you back down or, or present yourself in the public as if you couldn't win a fight, but realistically do the Mike Tyson's or the Jake Paul's putting you all together like that. But, um, but truly you're, you're a big boxer right now. He's potentially the greatest of all time is fear is a lack of confidence, something you have to go up against. Or once you get to a certain point, it's like, I never have fear. I'm not scared of anybody. Or do you have to like work past that fear? Cause it's natural. Yeah, no, I think part of the fear is natural and it'll sort of always be lingering there. It's just like how you deal with it is what's crucial. And I think preparation and confidence in preparation and in the training is what makes a difference. If I know that I did every little single thing right and, you know, down to the which blueberries and strawberries am I eating on a daily basis and like what did I do the recovery? Did I do the miles? Did I do the sit ups? Did I do the neck workouts? Um, if you did every single thing right, then and you didn't cut any corners and you gave it your all every day, then you shouldn't be afraid of anything. And if you go in there and someone beats you, but you did everything you possibly could to pr prepare, then you just know that they were the better fighter that night. Yeah, no, no lingering questions. Well, you haven't lost yet. So we'll see in October if you can keep that streak going when it comes to better as we're closing out here. I love hearing personal stuff like yeah, like I know you guys want to build a great business together, but you guys love each other. We're all we're brothers in this room together. Like, what do you want from each other? Joey, what do you ultimately expect and want from Jake? And Jake, what do you want from Joey when you, when you think about each other and you know that you're trying to change the game together? Um, you know, what are those thoughts? I, I think it's, it's already there, you know, and um, it, it, we wouldn't have partnered if it wasn't already there. It's, it's an endless desire to be great at what we do and to be endlessly competitive um, and to have a crazy work ethic and to use our brains to collectively come together to problem solve and to build an amazing team and to change the course of, of history together. I think that's really what this is about and sharing the same vision. And now I think we both just want each other to execute, um, which we are. So it's, it's been great. Joey, why don't you take us home with uh, what you want from our guy, Jake here? You thinking about your long-term relationship? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't think I could have articulated that better myself, right? Like I, I dropped out of, college almost a decade ago pretty much since then saw trying to solve like almost the exact same problem right like there there isn't the category defining business in u.s sports gaming just like jake has recognized that there isn't the category defining business yet in u.s sports media yet at least with respect to the next generation and 
I think we have the opportunity to build something really great here. Um, and, and not just make a bunch of money together. I think the journey of building something from zero to one and then one to N, um, that really changes how people engage with sports in this country, which is a big mission, by the way. Like that's how a lot of people derive a lot of their, their, it's a predominant source of entertainment and, and just general camaraderie and happiness for people. It, we have an opportunity to build something really great, a company that, People are, are very enthusiastic about coming to the office every day and working at. And, you know, most of this team, we haven't, you know, I alluded to sort of being in person in Miami, like pretty much everybody who's joined the company has like sold their house elsewhere, has moved to Miami to build this thing with us. So that's the type of mentality that we have here. And I think both Jake and I just expect each other to execute and stay focused and, and build something truly great together. Great. Well, best of luck. Thank you for jumping on the podcast with us today, keeping it super real, super honest. And uh, I'll be looking out for the fight in October, and I'll be looking out to see what better does over the coming months and years. So thanks awesome. again, guys. Thank you. Thank you, man. Awesome. Appreciate you, man. That's a wrap on another episode of the My Other Passion podcast. I want to thank Jake Paul and Joey Levy for coming out and having a great conversation. I'm really curious to see where things go with better. I mean, I see their point. Everything is TikTok now. Everything is short form now. People are all about their instant gratification and their short attention span. So I could see micro betting take off with the newer generation. But of course, only time will tell. I'm also really interested to see where things go with Jake Paul's fighting career. He has this big fight in October, so we'll see if he can keep the undefeated streak going. In the meantime, holler at me if you got any suggestions or feedback for the pod. Join us next Wednesday for another guest. I'll see you then. I'm out.